uh, it's after lunch, so thank you for being here. Um, we're a small group, so are you willing to come closer? We can just talk. Is that? Don't be scared. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll come over here. Hi. So they want me to use the microphone for the the people online. So we'll we'll keep doing it this way. Um. Yeah. But I would really love to hear from each of you. Um. You see some questions that I put up here. So does your university have a repository, um, or are you thinking about developing one? Um, and if so, you know why or what what benefit would you see? Uh, what kind of material would you put in it? Um, does your university publish journals? Um, and generally, what interests you in this workshop or, or this topic? So, uh, so would you mind starting and just telling me? Poți poți să duci în românește dacă dacă n-a fost clar. Puteți spune în românește. Da. Nu știu exact ce să spun. Am am venit să ascult despre ce e vorba, adică nu știu. Deci, de, de la ce universitate sunteți? Nu sunt de la, de la Institutul de Chimie din Timișoara. Okay. Da. Și aveți un fel de repository sau undeva unde puneți um, materialele care le, le produceți științifice? A, doar le publicăm, adică nu, nu le depun. Deci nu, nu le culegeți într-un într loc nu. al vostru? Da. Nu. Și ar, um, ar fi vedeți vreo valoare în, în așa ceva? Vă, vă interesează? Păi de asta sunt aici. <laughs> Vreau să aflu mai multe, exact. dar nu știu momentan prea Am multe. Zis. Și, da. Da, de asta nici nu am știut ce să răspund și din păi start. Nu, am zis că perfect. nu. Am da, înțeles da, perfect. Da. Și da, din asta, dacă... programul Horizon 2020 e vorba de un NOAD, National Open Access Textum, în Israel. Și putem să facem, într-adevăr, o politică de open access în România, mm -hmm. să identificăm exact care sunt repozitoarele externe, să respecte condițiile planului S sau coaliția S, care sunt. Da, deci, într-adevăr, pentru mulți, repozitorul este mecanismul de a, a crea open access. Deci, este un a principal tool for, for open access. Yeah, I'm interested. Ok. Bună ziua, eu vin de la Universitatea de Vest din Timișoara, de la Facultatea de Științe al Comunicării. Am venit pur și simplu să văd prezentarea, să aflu mai multe despre repozitorii. Și doamna de lângă mine vă poate spune mai multe, pentru că noi lucrăm cu BCUT și, practic, um, BCUT este ceea ce vă interesează. Bună ziua! Lucrez la Biblioteca Centrală Universitară uh, Eugen Todoran din Timișoara, deservim în principal Universitatea de Vest. Um, suntem abonați, cred că, din anul 2002 la Elsevier Science Direct, cu noi a început, uh, cred că, primele baze de date din România. Deci, instituția noastră le-a achiziționat prima oară. Uh, ce să vă zic, nu avem uh, noi un repozitorii, pentru că avem foarte multe baze de date. Ele sunt, uh, cum să zic, uh, um, depozitul de literatură științifică la care au acces profesorii și studenții care sunt utilizatorii bibliotecii, dar în România există proiecte cu digital repository, știu de Universitatea Transilvania din Brașov ca o grămadă de publicații open access și sunt indexate în două și în alte baze de date mari. În rest, ce să vă zic? Deci, se lucrează la publicațiile foarte vechi, colecțiile speciale și 
noi încă nu facem parte din, din cum să zic, con, nu e consorțiu, dar sunt mai multe instituții care fac lucrul acesta în România. Deci se lucrează și la noi. Și um, proiectele astea sunt conduse din bibliotecă sau din alte grupuri? Nu, pe... sunt, sunt plătite de către Ministerul Educației. Um, am înțeles că sunt contractate firme care să digitalizeze împreună cu instituții care dețin publicații valoroase. Deci sunt... Okay. Da. Veniți să, să învăț. Deci, este <laughs> europeană, culturalia, care va fi deci, bazele acestea de date, care sunt uh, uh, repozitorii. Și vedeți vreo valoare pentru universitatea dumneavoastră în a avea așa ceva? Uh, da, am fi. Uh, deci noi avem uh, 12 biblioteci filiale uh, pentru fiecare domeniu al Universității de Vest, teoretic, așa sunt constituite. Avem o bibliotecă de colecții speciale, care aceea ar fi cea mai valoroasă, uh -huh. dacă e, să spun, cei mai valoros în bibliotecă. Uh -huh. Și ce fel de materiale? Fotografii? Că, că, cărți că, foarte cărți. vechi, de la 1600. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Deci, îmi pare rău că nu este colegul meu care le, de, cum să zic, e custod de peste ele, dar uh, sunt documente valoroase. depozit instituțional care în mare parte în România universitățile care au deja implementat acest sistem se bazează pe DSpace, deci în principal informația în România în momentul de față universitățile care au, sunt câteva care au pornit acum câțiva ani acest proiect național, se bazează pe platforma DSpace. Deci, probabil că de ea ați auzit. E mai simplu decât, da, 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 exact. Păi eu nu sunt Nu sunt de la universitate, sunt doar o persoană curioasă. Conduc o școală și un liceu, bilingv. Ne interesează foarte tare bazele de date, dar din cu totul și cu totul alt aspect. În schimb, sunt foarte legată de universitatea pe care am făcut-o și mă interesează absolut orice legat de uh, povestea aceasta cu baze de date și cu uh, reținerea în uh, depozitarea lor în, uh, în astfel de medii alternative. Și sunt uh, pur, pur și simplu interesată și curioasă. Da. Și de ce fel de baze de date? Că sunt foarte diferite. Uh, nu e vorba de bibliografie, nu e vorba de resurse. Noi avem resurse educaționale, majoritatea de pe, din bibliotecile virtuale Cambridge, deci e destul de stabilă uh, povestea, dar bazele de date în ceea ce privește tot ce putem deține despre istoricul școlii, despre elevi, despre părinți, în așa fel încât să putem să lucrăm pe, cu instrumente sociologice potrivite. E, e, e și nu e același lucru. Da, da. Dar mă interesează foarte tare subiectul. Deci n-am venit întâmplător. <laughs> Vin de la Universitatea Națională de Educație Fizică și Sport. București uh, și Universitatea organizează anual un congres, Congresul Universității și, da, pe de-o parte suntem implicați și prezentăm lucrări și frecvent găsim pe LSV uh, articole interesante și un, unul din volumele conferinței acum câțiva ani a fost indexat în uh, uh, SEVI. Și conferința au publicat pe unul de DSP sau cum publicați materiale? Uh, în bază de date. 
Da, poate să fie acesta. A fost anul trecut, anul acesta și anul trecut. Future Academy. Cam, cam așa. Dar mai devreme am fost interesată, nu știu dacă o să prezentați acum, faptul că și jurnale ale studenților noi nu avem, dar cine știe, poate în viitor le indexați le indexați, le puneți în baza de date. Eu vin de la Institutul de Chimie, sunt cercetător acolo și e un domeniu din care eu nu prea știu multe, dar noi, în cercetătorii din Institut, publicăm la reviste și articole de specialitate. Și mă interesează așa să cunosc pentru cultură, pentru... Mai ales că trimitem și la LSV, trimitem articole și mă interesează. Mulțumesc mult! Um, eu vin de la Biblioteca Institutului Fizică și Inginerie Nucleară Horia Hulubei. Încercăm și noi să facem un depozit din asta instituțional dar mă interesează foarte mult cum este cu acceptul autorului, adică ce anume avem voie să introducem în acest depozit. Că știu că este o problemă. Ne gândeam prima dată la niște titluri de teze de doctorat, doar titlu, să fie pe circuit intern, să nu se vadă în afară, adică noi avem și cea mai mare bibliotecă de fizică din țară, suntem pe domeniu, adică lângă Eli, lângă la cel mai mare care se construiește și Vreau să aflu mai multe detalii. Cum, cum putem să-l construim cât mai bine, cât mai util pentru cercetătorii noștri de fizică. Da, da, da. Bună ziua, sunt Alin Găureanu, doctorand la Universitatea Politehnică Timișoara. Topicul meu este Securitatea, Sănătatea, Muncă. Am publicat la diverse conferințe în prosedinguri. Am până acum 8 lucrări indensate ISI și sunt în continuare interesat cum se dezvoltă bazele de date și la ce mă poate ajuta la un punctaj cât mai mare. Pentru lucrările, pentru lucrările mele, pentru cariera mea. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll switch to English. Um, so I think based on what I'm hearing, a, a general introduction is what everybody's hoping for. Good, I can do that. Um, and I think, uh, so really my goal is to show you, you know, all the possible ways that a university or an institute can use a repository. And um, some of them might be exactly what you're thinking. Some of them might be new. So let me just show you everything. Um, it's like a, you know, a buffet, and then you can, you can tell me what seems most relevant for, for what your uh, institute is, uh, is working on. Um, so, you know, repositories really started as uh, a home for published articles. So the idea was, you know, my researchers publish in, you know, Elsevier journals and Springer journals, and, uh, and I want, as a university, I want them, all those articles with me, right, in my library, in my university. So the, the question I think that, uh, that our colleague asked about, you know, copyright, you know, how do you get fac uh, professors' papers into the repository, that was the biggest purpose for a repository. Um, I think in the last 10 years, that vision has really expanded. So if you look at most, uh, many repositories today, certainly in the US, there's actually a lot more material, not just research articles. So um, what I'm you know, hoping to show here is uh, all the different things that you might use a repository to showcase. So uh, certainly professors' articles, research articles, um, but also uh, uh, student projects, um, also research data, um, video, audio, multimedia, 
um, historical collections, images. Um, a lot of our customers use digital commons for their uh, university yearbooks or newspapers, so any kind of historical material. Um, there's also uh, publishing, which we'll talk about, so publishing your own journals, publishing your own conferences, having students publish their own journals. Uh, I'll show you some examples of that. So really the idea is that it's um, really meant to capture everything that your institute or university produces. And the goal is just to make sure that the whole world knows what you're doing, right? So you have a lot of um, authors writing things, uh, developing things, doing projects. Where are those, right? Who, who can find them? Where, where would somebody go to find those things? So that's really what the repository is, uh, is meant to do. So this uh, kind of, as I was saying this morning, really thinking about the repository as a tool. Um, this is a, a quote from a, a, library, uh, a, a library dean um, that the repository demonstrates to the world the importance of what you are doing and what your contributions are. So every university, every institute is producing things of value. Are you sure that people know about that, right? So this is really the idea is make sure that the world can see and discover what you're producing. Um, so I'll start, um, basically I'll, I'll go through four big categories of content. So this one is about uh, research, and then we'll talk about students, student work, um, we'll talk about publishing, and then we'll talk about archives and special collections, so historical materials. Um, so that's it, I'm gonna go there and start showing you some examples. No. Ah, yes. <laughs> okay, I'm back. So yeah, so I'm going to just show you lots of examples. So we'll, you know, you kind of get a, get a sense of what's involved here. Um, so we were, oh, I want to show you what's on my screen, which we did before. It definitely worked before. Yeah. So I, yeah, I'm hoping that. It's there, yeah, okay. So here's an example of, like I said, this mo the most traditional kind of material in a repository. This is a paper um, that was already published and it is now uh, available through the repository at University of Kentucky. That's uh, one of the customers that we work with. Um, so there was a question I think about copyright and you know, what, what can be put into a repository. So this paper has already been published and in a journal, um, but you will find that most academic journals have some permissions to include those professors' articles into your repository. So a lot of the customers that we work with, they just, uh, they've learned how to check for the rights and for the copyright. Are we doing it now? Okay, um, they've learned how to do that. So the library will usually manage this process of getting uh, the papers, identifying the papers in the journals and making sure that they're put into the repository. Um, so that's one example. Um, but what I really wanna share with you is that in fact, this is really just one piece of a much larger 
puzzle of all the materials that are in the repository. So even if you have trouble finding those research articles or you have concerns about copyright, it's okay because there's a lot more that you can do that doesn't rely on, uh, on those copyright issues. Um, so let me see if I can show you more examples. Uh, okay. I think I can do this. Okay. Okay, this is a different kind of collection. This is a collection of video. This was never published, right? You're not gonna publish a video in a book or a journal. Um, this is a particular faculty member. Um, Fairfield University is a Catholic university. It's a Jesuit, a Jesuit university. And um, this particular professor has uh, had created many, many hours of videos on various topics of theology and religious studies. And in fact, if you, if you uh, let me just scroll down a little bit. It's a little hard to see, but they've um, the library who worked with him on this uh, organized all of his videos um, according to the various topics of religious studies. Um, so you've got you know different topics like uh, the existence of God <laughs> or uh, Jesuits. So let me click on one of those. And these are treated just like research articles, but what they actually are um, is is just some short videos. And in fact, they're, they're streaming, in this case, they're streaming from YouTube. So, you know, this is, I think, such an interesting example because it's not uh, anything published, right? You would never find this item in an Elsevier journal or a, a, a Springer journal. Um, it's never been published. And before the repository, this particular researcher just kept these media files on his computer. He had no place to share them. He had no way to share them. Um, now that he's made them available, online um, and you know you can see that they, they're treated like academic publications right they all have an abstract they have a citation um, you can recognize at the bottom that creative commons license that's a, a a license that lets the world know that this is in public domain that it can be reused it can be cited it's open access you know it's fully public so this is a, a situation where the library helped to digitize these videos and helped to create the records, the metadata, and actually curated them so that in the final result, this professor has a permanent record uh, of the work that he did. And then, of course, now uh, others can come and use it. Um, and these are actually very often used in classrooms. So these are, um, in the US, we call it an open educational resource. So they're basically a you know, free curriculum that another teacher, um, maybe in a different country or somewhere else in the US, uh, could actually use these videos when they're also teaching, you know, some of these topics of, of, you know, theology. So, you know, thinking about really broadly, you know, what do your professors actually produce? I'm sure they produce published articles, but they probably also produce videos, curriculum, classroom materials, textbooks. So, if you, you know, would there be a value in uh, collecting all of the all of that work and also making that available online? Um, and, you know, the gentleman who's here uh, himself as a researcher, um, probably as a researcher, you produce more than just what you publish in the, in the traditional journal publications. Let's find another example, if I can. Since we've... We saw the presentation earlier about 3D printers. Um, let me go ahead and, and share one of my favorite examples here. This is another uh, faculty member in the chemistry, uh, chemistry department. And um, he, let's see. Great. Um, he developed some scripts uh, to produce through a 3D printer, um, these renditions of, uh, in this case, protein domains. And so he was trying to understand these protein domains. Of course, it's very abstract, right? You can't see them because they're very small. And he decided to create these models for protein domains. Um, and he used a 3D printer to uh, produce them. 
and he decided to actually go ahead and share this script. So if I click on this item, this is not a published article. This is a, the, the actual script that you could, I, I lost my 3D printer, but if I had it, <laughs> I could you know, send this to the 3D printer and print for you right now this uh, beta barrel, which is a type of a protein domain. Um, again, this was used in a classroom. So this is a, a professor who developed these models to help teach his class in a more visual and more concrete way, you know, these, these complex chemical structures. Um, and because he did this work, he decided to make the scripts available uh, to the public. And um, like the one example that we saw earlier, this is now also uh, has a Creative Commons license. So it's clearly open access and for reuse. Um, you know, I've talked to some of the people at this conference and realizing that indeed, you know, there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of emphasis on the applied sciences. I mean, we're here at the Polytechnic University, but gen generally there's an interest in more applied sciences in helping students be more engaged with new media, with emerging media. So the thing that's really nice is, you know, can you reflect that in your repository? Can you start to actually show to the world these creative projects that you, that your professors and your students are working on? Let's find another example. I think, you know, when we're talking about um, research grants uh, and starting to be, you know, plan S compliant and compliant with some of the, uh, the other mandates uh, coming out of the EU, um, there's a big emphasis on sharing research data, right? So the idea is it's not enough to publish your article. You need to help your audience uh, find the original data uh, underneath your research. Um, that helps your article be uh, replicable, so other people can test your results and make sure that they're, you know, that they're uh, that they're replicable and, and should be considered scientific results. So a lot of universities use their repository as a home for their research data. Um, this is an example at a University of Massachusetts Medical School. Um, as a medical school in the U.S., they're under um, government mandates to make their medical research data public. And so Digital Commons is a solution for that. Um, so in this case, they just have a, a collection of all of their research data uh, from various different articles, different projects. Let's just click on one of these. And you know, it's, um, you know, one thing that's nice about Digital Commons is that you can customize the metadata. So in this case, they have uh, really extensive metadata um, specific to research data. So things like um, the DOI, the citation, um, you know, you can be very, very clear about the kind of um, record, you know, how you want to structure your record for, for discovery. So yeah, using, you know, using a repository to fulfill research data mandates is, is one, of the many, one of the many uses as well. Um, one of the new formats that we've seen is um, not just 3D printing, but 3D scanning. Um, do any of your libraries have a 3D scanner? This is pretty rare, so it's a very cool thing <laughs> um, where you can actually you know, do, do a three-dimensional scan of, a, of an artifact. So if you have a sculpture, or it's most commonly used in, uh, in archaeology. Um, so this is an example of an archaeology publication. Um, and it's, ah, well, I, I picked the wrong example, so you'll, you'll have to, you know, let me, let me imagine it for you. Um, but normally, uh, when this works, um, it's actually, you can actually move this object around. So it's a, it's a piece of, of, of ceramics, and you can actually move it around in the, in the renderer. So if I have time, I'll, I'll find you another one like that. Um, but in any case, they, you know, they, they, all, they have uh, here the, um, the original files, which can also create that 3D scan for you. And then, you know, the article itself is, you can see it right here, this is just the, uh, the description of the item as, a, uh, as, a, as an article. So it's an article about this, uh, this piece of pottery um, that has the 3D scan. Okay, where's my cursor? There we go. So I guess, you know, hopefully you're detecting a pattern. Um, which is that you don't have to limit yourself to just thinking about research articles when you're planning your repository. That in fact, a repository is much more exciting and interesting to the world when you start including some of these diverse content types. And a lot of your researchers probably do produce these content types. So I think, you know, kind of talking to your researchers, not just, you know, when did you publish in a journal, 
but also, you know, do you have uh, multimedia? Do you have data? Do you have curricular teaching materials that might, uh, you know, they, they might get more interested in that. Um, one thing that we found, I think, one of the biggest challenges that uh, repositories in the U.S. face is that they have a hard time getting their professors to to work with the library and get their papers in. And this is a big challenge for open access, right? I mean, everybody wants uh, open access to grow, um, but you, you actually need to rely on your researchers to tell you, you know, to give you their publications. So, you know, how do you get your researchers involved or engaged or paying attention? Um, but one of the ways to do that is to actually uh, build profiles for them where it's not just the university's showcase, but it's also a, a personal showcase for that scholar. So let me show you an example of a, of a researcher profile. Um, this is a, a faculty member in uh, agriculture, uh, entomology, insect, insect studies. And so you know, this page basically is her own personal repository. So she's able to upload here her own papers. Um, she can upload uh, you know, articles that she's published, but she can also upload other things. Let's see if I can get to it. Um, you know, other more applied research that she's done. So in her case, in addition to the articles, uh, she's also produced um, these podcasts. These are audio uh, podcasts about um, soybean aphids, uh, which is a, a kind of an insect that eats soybeans. So if you're a professor of agriculture, you're really interested in insects that eat uh, soybeans, so that she has the industry-leading podcast on this topic. And so basically, it's letting each faculty member, each professor, kind of develop their own profile, their own online CV of their research. And it's got, of course, um, their photo, uh, contact information. And, you know, in general, it's, it's giving them a, like a personal connection to the repository. So it's, it's their own personal repository. So that's kind of a, a set of examples about research, you know, kind of professor uh, or researcher work. Um, I'm going to move to talking about student work, but let me know if there's any questions about uh, anything that we've seen so far. OK, we'll carry on. So yeah, student research. And it's really interesting. I've um, traveled to a lot of countries uh, in the past two years, and in some countries, they really don't like the idea of making their student work available online. Um, in the US, it's a huge trend. Um, in the US, one of the primary goals of the repository now is to capture the best student research um, in order to attract new students. So it's seen as a tool for recruitment. It's seen as a way to make the university competitive with other universities if you know, students are finding uh, their own papers in their repository. And from what I've seen this morning in the discussions here, it does sound like in this environment, um, there is interest and openness to showcasing some of the student work. So I will spend a little bit of time um, in showing you some examples here. So students also produce research. Um, they produce research in all uh, shapes and sizes and different formats. Um, probably the most traditional kind of student research is a dissertation or a thesis. Um, so here's an example of that. This is at a, a university in Illinois, um, and one of their biggest collections is the master's theses from their um, master's degree program. Um, and as you can see from the map here, uh, student work is very popular around the world. Um, in, in fact, it's one of the most downloaded kinds of material that we host is student theses student dissertations. So um, if you digitize, oh, by the way, how many of you guys have electronic theses or, or do your students still produce them in print? Anybody electronic with theses now, dissertations, still print and, and bound? OK. So if you ever wanted to make room in your library, yeah. <laughs> Form. Uh, and after that, uh, we have this uh, procedure. Uh, it becomes a part of the archive. And uh, there is this scanning uh, for plagiarism. 
So um, if somebody is taking something from your thesis or somebody else can be detected and see if it's the right quotation or something like that. And is that done at your university or is that a national thesis? No, it's a national uh, ah. procedure for okay. the universities and for uh, PhD schools, programs mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Okay. And is that by the Ministry of Education that does it? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes, great. Good, well, I'm happy to hear that because it sounds like the workflows are there, right? The system is there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what potentially you could add value there is just making those uh, theses more discoverable. Uh, and yeah. this is, I'm sorry, no, no. <laughs> uh, this is for the students as well who are graduating or master degree students. Yes, yes. Okay, this is master degree, I understood, but in Romania as well, uh, graduation, bachelor, and uh, master degree, and PhD. Okay. Oh, so every um, bach bachelor's student creates a thesis as well, like a bachelor's thesis? Great. Okay, exactly. So that's wonderful to hear because, you know, like I said, for, for many of our customers, the, the theses and dissertations are the core content for the repository and they really do get lots and lots of downloads. So for this particular university, you know, they've had half a million downloads for maybe 5,000 uh, theses. And what we've actually found is that these theses, when, when you look at who's downloading them, it's often uh, corporations or applied research organizations because they're looking for more applied research. They're looking for um, really quick sort of current research and they know that the theses or the dissertations often show that. So there's a really a lot of value um, in, in having those available, very easily available for uh, you know, private companies to find, uh, for other universities to find um, as well. And of course, for the students, it's really nice when they see uh, that their work has been downloaded. Good, so that's one example for sure. Um, pretty, yeah, pretty much the, the most traditional example of student research. I mean, they use Google Scholar, Google, to, to identify different uh, subject uh, theses, and this is how they enter the website of that university. Yeah. Uh, Exactly. So this is the flow. Yeah, yeah, and thank you for reminding me because I, I talked a lot this morning about downloads and I never really explained where they come from. Yeah, so um, what, what we're recognizing more and more is that not just researchers outside the academy, but all researchers are much more likely to start searching on Google or Google Scholar for their materials. And of course, if they have Scopus, they'll go there. Of course, if they have Science Direct, they'll go there. But not everybody has those tools. And a lot of people are just more comfortable. They just go to Google, you know, Google, Google. And so really, um, Digital Commons is very optimized for that, for Google discovery. So um, certainly researchers outside of universities, that's what they're looking for. Um, and they're just looking for general topical searches. So, so Digital Commons in particular is designed to capture those readers. So, you know, when, I'm, when I showed you some of those statistics this morning of, you know, uh, universities that have 10 million downloads, 20 million downloads, um, probably 90% of those downloads are coming from Google. So that's the, the very, very large universe of potential readers when you are optimized for that sort of open web searching. So yeah, it really is about sort of breaking open, not just the contents, but also the audience, right? Going outside of the university. And indeed the corporate readers are, are one thing that, you'll, that you would attract that way. Yeah. Um, I think as we were saying this morning, student research uh, isn't just print, um, but students do research in all sorts of other formats, uh, including, let's see, what's my favorite here? Uh, these are GIS, posters. Oh, I, can't, I don't even know where to go. Um, yeah, okay, let's look at the GIS. Um, so GIS, this is a geographic information systems. Um, huge growing field. You know, a lot of people are doing the, you know, the satellite imagery analysis and trying to do kind of, ge you know, geolocation types of studies. So this is a project uh, at DePaul University um, where the graduate students are working in the lab uh, doing this kind of G G GIS or, or geological information systems research. 
um, and they're producing uh, posters in this case and kind of geological geographical analyses. Um, so this is taking advantage of the um, image functionality in Digital Commons, where if I open this, it's actually going to show me the actual image. Um, and then I could actually uh, zoom in. You can get pretty, pretty detailed uh, in the work that was done here. Um, and then in addition uh, to that, um, this collection is itself uh, geolocated. So I can, this is a, using a Google, Google Maps plugin. You can actually go out to Google Maps and it'll show you where these posters, uh, where the work was done. So for example, this was done uh, here. Um, you can actually see the actual poster. So it's letting you kind of create a nice view. Um, I know somebody mentioned that at your university you have historical maps, probably you know hundreds of historical maps. Um, so I'll show you an example of that in just a moment. But it's the same idea that you can actually you know capture the the map uh, and the location. Um, great. So that's uh, as far as okay. So then the last kind of student work I wanted to talk about is indeed you know could students manage their own journal. Um, could students manage their own conferences? So in the US, for a lot of universities, um, it's pretty typical that they would have an annual student research conference. Do any of your universities or do you know universities that do that here, that every year the students are invited to present their own research? Right. So yeah, that, that happens um, everywhere in the US now. It's, it's really kind of expected that at a university, the students are being prepared for their future career as a researcher. And the best way to be prepared is to do what we're doing here, right? You do presentations, you do posters, you, do, uh, you, 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 you submit to a conference. So let me show you an example of the conference. Um, so Digital Commons is a little bit unusual and different from DSpace um, because it is also a publishing platform as well as a repository. So, so far we've only seen the repository functionality, um, but now I'm, a, I'm going to show you some of the publishing structures. So this is a, a conference. Um, so what do I mean that it's a publishing structure? Um, what I mean is that uh, in the back end, there include the tools for submission, um, proposal management, editorial management, peer review, and publishing. So these, um, the students who run this conference do everything from um, soliciting manuscripts, uh, getting the manuscripts uh, into the system, getting them accepted through peer review, and then publishing them uh, into the front end. So just to show you uh, what a conference looks like, this is a, an annual uh, student research conference. Um, it's across the entire university, so they have all the different departments here. And I think, let's see which one is good. Um, some of them are gonna be music performances, ooh, wine studies. Okay, let's see. <laughs> uh, this um, university is, is right next to the wine. Um, there's a big wine area in, the, in Oregon where they make a lot of Pinot Noir. Um, so I guess this student took advantage of that. Um, and then indeed, here's that student's paper uh, from, um, from that session. So you know, again, keep in mind that this was accepted. Uh, this was reviewed and accepted through an internal peer review process. Um, I think a lot of times when people have concerns about student work. They're concerned that you know the quality of the work isn't so good, or maybe it's plagiarized. So that's why it's it's really really important that um, that all of this is actually go, goes through a review and approval process, right? It's it's not just the students are not free to just put up uh, whatever they want. Um, so that's an example of a student research conference and kind of a, a research day. Um, the other example I wanted to show you of a uh, is a student journal. Um, I don't know if you, if you, I mean, I think you all know how expensive it is to go to college in the US, to go to a university in the US. You're paying probably $40,000 a year is tuition right now. So I have a three-year-old daughter and I'm already saving for her college. <laughs> so um, so it, right now it costs a parent to send their student to university about $200,000 total. Okay. So if you're a parent and you're gonna pay that much money, you're, you have a very high standard for what you expect to get in return, right? You're, you're not just gonna pay that money and you know, you know, hope, hope for the best. You, you expect that that university is going to prepare your student for you know, a graduate school or a job or you know, something uh, that will pay you back <laughs> eventually. Um, so a lot of universities in the US are coming up with more innovative programs to help those students um, be employable 
as soon as they leave the university. So there, there's this idea that you have to teach them early, um, you know, hands-on learning. Um, we call it experiential learning, um, which is what I, that's how, a theme I heard this morning as well. So um, letting students publish their own journal, academic journal, is one of the best ways to do that. Um, basically, it's teaching the students to do their own peer review, to be editors, um, to reject papers or accept papers or ask you know, for revisions on a paper um, so that you know, when they graduate, they can put on their resume, I was an editor of this peer-reviewed scientific journal um, or I was published in this peer-reviewed scientific journal. Um, so this is one example. This is a journal of economics. Um, it is entirely published by students. So you can see on the, uh, uh, in the, um, the list on the right, these are the student editors. They have a mentor who's a professor of economics, and they also have a mentor in the library. So these mentors are there to teach the students how do you really, be, you know, how do you do editorial management? You know, how do you do peer review? How do you accept a manuscript? You know, how do you do copyright? Right. So from a library's perspective, the, these students are also learning about open access. They're learning about publishing. Um, so you're kind of getting them young. Um, and then, of course, for the students, when they graduate, they can say, you know, I was the editor of this journal or I was published in a journal. Um, nowadays, when you graduate from university, you're expected to have publications. It's no longer, you know, when you're a professor, you, you have to have publications from, you know, age 19. <laughs> so, so this is one way, one way to do it. Um, so these student journals do really, really well. So this particular one um, has, again, about half a million downloads, um, about 200 papers total. Um, and this is a, an international journal, so they actually receive submissions from students around the world. Um, by the way, if any of you have students who would like to submit to journals, um, we actually have a list of uh, journals in the US who accept student submissions. Um, so that you know that that just it's a way to get them familiar with that whole process of, of submitting um, articles. So yeah, that's a kind of a a, a, a use of a of, of a repository as well, which is a it's sort of home for student work. Okay, any questions about student work? When did the știu eu scopus, trebuie să verific un pic informația ca să vă dau exact răspunsul cu drepturile de autor. Recunosc că nu este specialitatea mea. Ca să dacă le exact. se poate accesa direct și dau la da. Deci, scopus este o bază de date de abstracte. Ea înmagazinează sau indexează atât jurnale publicate de Elsevier, dar și de alți publisher. Deci nu indexăm Bun. doar ok. În momentul în care uh, o teză este publicată de un jurnal, să spunem, Elsevier, da. care este vizibil, bineînțeles, în Scopus, dar vă spun sincer, sunt câteva jurnale pe care Elsevier le publică care nu sunt indexate încă în Scopus, că sunt încă noi. Da? Uh, trece prin același proces ca oricare alt jurnal care nu este publicat de noi pentru a fi indexat. Deci trebuie să corespundă acelorași criterii de, de indexare și de, de calificare. Bun, dar nu rezultat ca să poată să fie citit, da? Dacă e... Un autor, trebuie să plătească, fie abonament la site direct, fie la... Pentru a fi citit, da, Bun. exact. Și deci, în momentul de față, dacă un uh, cercetător are acces la uh, baza de date Scopus, dar să spunem că nu are acces la Science Direct, el vede și găsește rezultatele Scopus, găsește lucrarea respectivă, dând click pe ea, nu poate intra pentru că nu are acces la Science Direct dar poate citi abstract. Asta în cazul Persevier. Dacă vorbim de al și este fix aceeași... Da. Articole care se pot... Vorbim de jurnale, da? Deci acolo găsim tot la nivel de articol și jurnale. Corect. Da. Bun. Dacă eu am fost dată, dar la despre la gratuit... Aici vorbim de alt sistem. 
Pentru că ăsta este totul acest de este la nivel de universitate, nu vorbim de o bază de date generală ca scopus. Scopus este o bază... Dar cu acces în exterior sau numai o bază? Nu, este baza de date Digital Commons, este a universității și este accesibilă din exterior. Din exterior de, și este făcut din exterior accesul de către universitate, gen pe site-ul universității. Este construit site-ul astfel încât are secțiuni care se înmăgăzează în această informație. Să rezultatele unei teze de doctorat, fără să mai plătească da, accesul la revista care a publicat prima oară acele rezultate. Deci, în primul rând, ca să fie accesibil pe Digital Commons, el trebuie să respecte întâi acordul pe care îl are la nivel de jurnal. Dacă jurnal, vorbim de open access aici, da? Dacă jurnal, de obicei, jurnalele au o anumită perioadă de embargo, după care autorul este liber să-și publice lucrarea în orice bază de date, pe orice site personal al universității, nu contează. Deci, după acea perioadă de embargo și după acea licență pe care o semnează cu jurnalul la momentul în care hotărăște să publice în, în cadrul jurnalului respectiv. Deci, nu orice teză ajunge? Ajunge, dar după o anumită perioadă, după ce expiră licența pe care o are uh, agreată și semnată cu jurnalul care a publicat inițial lucrarea. Că e vorba de SEPIR sau de orice altcineva, nu contează. Nu e Just to be clear, though, the um, the theses that you're seeing here have never been published in any journal. They were directly put into Digital Commons. So that's that's I mean that's the student's choice, right? So. Yeah, that's the student. I'm talking about the theses of the students. That means that no, no, they were published in journals that didn't see the interest to say them in scopes. We're talking about another base of data, not the same as that which trece prin criteriile de indexare pentru scopus. Sau Web of Science, nu contează care sunt întrebatele. Oricum, la noi, de exemplu, în țară, trebuie de urmat, trebuie să conțină automat niște rezultate ce au fost publicate în prealabil în reviste specifice. Care pot avea... Este menționat acest lucru. Scopus este una, Digital Commons este o altă platformă care face altceva la nivel. Deci, tezele de doctorat publicate, care sunt de ce ne-a de, nu știu exact, despărtarea uh, agenției uh, da. guvernamentale care verifică și da. certifică că nu da. sunt plagiate da. și așa mai departe, așa, uh, trec, au criterii foarte specifice pentru jurnale care sunt interesate în bază de alată Web of Science sau uh, Scopus. Asta vor, uh, Digital Commons este o platformă folosită la nivel de universitate prin care ei vor să-și facă vizibilă uh, alte lucrări, nu neapărat lucrările științifice care oricum sunt publicate în jurnalele științifice ale universității sau ale publisherului. Mai discutăm. Ok. Thank you. Um, Oh, let me let me go on to the last the last set of examples, and then we can we can all go. So I think we we saw um, examples of conferences and journals already. So let me uh, go to the last uh, slide, which is um, historical collections. And here I'm certain that the libraries have a lot of amazing, wonderful historical collections. So let me just show you um, a few examples from from the universities that, that we support. Um, so yeah, we talked about Map collections, um, and this is one. So, you know, I think as you've seen, uh, Digital Commons has different functionality for images, uh, for video, you know, so you can really incorporate beautiful multimedia. Um, so yeah, this is a, a historical map collection. Um, each map has its own record. There we go. And you know, these get downloaded too. <laughs> these are, are very popular as well. Um, so yeah, indeed, you can show, uh, you can do a lot of zooming um, here at the, this is a very high resolution one actually. Um, so yeah, I mean, this can be a, a complete solution for any of these archives, uh, archival collections. Um, let me just show you a few more. Uh, people also use it for uh, rare books and manuscripts. Um, this one is pretty cool. 
and I, I'm going to show you two more examples, and then we can we can all go because I, I have a, an athletics a sports example too. Um, this is a historical book uh, of uh, uh, laws, called, uh, Leg, Leg, Leg and um, and this one uh, takes advantage of a of a nice little feature where you can actually turn the pages. Some reason that's not something that would be okay, but but you get the idea. So you'd actually be able to turn the pages um, of this this digitized book uh, here, and then um, because there was somebody here from sports, um, let me just show you the last example I have, which is on on sports. Oh, I've done something to my mouse. Okay, everything stopped working. This may be a sign <laughs> that I should stop. Um, but yes, if, if anyone's curious to see sports examples, we actually have a lot of those um, as well. So good, I hope that was fun. Um, at least just, you know, like I said, kind of a, a buffet of options. Um, and I hope it gave you some ideas uh, for collections you could try to get uh, at your universities. So all done, thank you.